Okay, we are live and recording. Welcome everyone. And as a reminder, you all are on mute, uh, except for a couple of the speakers. You have the opportunity to uh, put on your video if you should choose to. That's in the bottom left-hand corner. No need for you to necessarily do that. You have the option at the top right-hand corner uh, to look at a speaker's view for allow this person who's speaking to come larger on your screen if you wish. Uh, if for some reason you should unmute yourself, we would ask that you mute back as quickly as possible. And if you have any specific questions, you can provide those through the chat feature uh, at the bottom of your screen. Tom? So welcome to all of our ACCU presidents and your colleagues. Uh, we have an excellent cross-section this afternoon of our member schools represented as we gather for the first in a series of three webinars on consecutive Mondays. These webinars are made possible through partnerships with respected organizations. Today we benefit from the cooperative spirit of Susan Wheeler Johnston, president of Nakubo, and our own president, Father Dennis Holschneider. Special thanks to Jim Hundreiser of Nakubo, who reached to us at ACCU, worked closely with Dennis and myself to customize the first two programs, and is providing the technology platform today. Just a word about format. Both today and next Monday, Jim will make a 20-minute presentation, and then two of our ACCU presidents will address topics much in the minds of our members. Many thanks to those of you who submitted specific questions that we will be using. We'll have questions in three major topic areas, major budget adjustments and a few specific areas of interest, overall financial strategy, and then finally governance practices, especially around mission-centric decision-making. Just two notes, you'll get a request from ACCU for feedback after each of the webinars. And after the third and final webinar, we will ask you for suggestions about possible additional webinar topics or other resources you might find helpful. And as Jim just said, please do keep yourself on mute so we don't hear children, pets, or other entertaining forms of background music. Uh, and with that, Jim, we'll turn right to you. Great. Uh, thank you everyone so much for allowing me this opportunity to be here and I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, the hardest part of the moment will be the sharing of the screen uh, to make things come to life. I think you are all currently looking at my emails, but I'm <laughs> hoping that we'll transition here in one second. There we go. Uh, as we uh, look at uh, the challenges and opportunities that you all have been facing, we know that um, COVID occurred and hit us uh, in some ways that we were underprepared for. Our HR systems were overwhelmed, students left unexpectedly. Uh, no one, I think, could see through the potential mix that we saw. And of course, from that uh, massive quick change, we saw the financial challenges that you all face with significant multi million dollar uh, refunds. Uh, the summer lost revenues that you've had, and then, of course, uh, much to many of our, our perplexions, uh, the many lawsuits that have been coming forward as students have been seeking refunds for their uh, tuition and other fees uh, that they felt were needed or deserved to them beyond that. And so that's caused a lot of reactions in the, in the environment. Certainly, some have questioned face-to-face, -face, uh, is it needed? And others have stated, and particularly as we look at student data from the last few weeks, saying, uh, the face-to-face -face experience has been uh, absolutely essential. On the Nakubo front, we've been working with the federal government as they work to act pretty quickly to distribute those dollars out to institutions. We will share with you there is some frustration about how those dollars have been distributed uh, back to students in particular. Uh, many of you uh, asked for guidance, even though we encouraged you not to ask for it, and then the guidance came, and it came in ways that we didn't necessarily want that guidance to come. And so the need and work you're doing to continue to advocate uh, for additional dollars, we do believe there will only be one chance left uh, to get additional dollars, at least in the short term. Uh, that will be after uh, 4th of July. And so any work you're doing to advance your advocacy for helping legislators understand the challenges that you're facing, uh, we strongly encourage you to do that. And as you look about what are you preparing for, we're seeing lots of data, lots of surveys talking about where are you at as you think about the future. Uh, first, we see you know, that kind of the virus is contained with isolated cases, but even within that, we think 
that your business model will remain strong, but likely with a reduction of potentially as much as 20% loss in revenue as you, act, you know, move through this. Uh, we know that activities will re remain, but be stressed, but your risk management actions are going to be costly. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The next potential uh, challenge is that the virus really resurges and the outbreak is manageable, but it really does begin to shift the online, uh, the business model again, um, co courses shift back to online or hybrid. We are again faced with more furloughs. And next week we'll talk a little bit more about the academic calendar piece, but we are certainly hearing the bulk of folks talking about coming back to school a little earlier and uh, closing by Thanksgiving. We are starting to hear some talk about starting a little later in the spring term, that if that second wave truly does hit uh, somewhere in November into December, will we be ready to start uh, by mid-January and might we have to start uh, a little later and start with a hybrid model again? Uh, or the third scenario is uh, stay-at-home orders are reissued and everybody uh, stays in place and we're back to an online model. We know for so many of you, that you are a residential institution focused on those residential opportunities for students and that would be uh, significant for you. So as you're beginning to figure out how large is your gap, uh, you know, we're really encouraging folks to think about, you know, if most students return, might you have a 10% loss in your tuition revenue, but a 25% loss in your auxiliary revenues. And uh, having worked in uh, private uh, education for many years. I know that that residence hall dollar supports far more than just the residence hall activities. Those are huge dollars. I know many of you are really trying to think through, can you have two to a room? What about one to a room? What about the, the uh, other costs that might come uh, from doing that? Um, I would say we are starting to hear more and more saying there is no business model for us without having uh, all of our residence hall beds filled or at two in a room as the capacity of the room has been uh, determined by its architectural codes. Uh, I, I know many of you have triples where they were supposed to be doubles and so you're trying to eliminate that. Uh, but there are you know, real challenges to the model when you're thinking about how large is your gap. Then next in that gap is you know, many don't return, so will that be 25% loss in tuition. I don't think it's unrealistic to think that should we have the outbreaks that we're beginning to see this week, that that should be a place where you are modeling or states come in. Uh, you may see that New York in particular is actively uh, navigating with institutions what the expectations will be. Some of you might have participated in a Chronicle a webinar at two o'clock today where uh, the president of Ithaca College spoke pretty eloquently about uh, we have this vision and the state is telling us something else. Each of your states may dictate what that's going to be and if you're not engaged or connected to them, uh, I certainly encourage you to do that. But I do think you should be modeling uh, what if half of your residence hall population needs to be offline. The PASHI schools, as examples, are talking about one, per, one student per room, two students per bathroom. They're coming up with all kinds of, of differing rules. I wonder how that will impact us as we think about that revenue gap. If we do go to the staggered start or stop, will you offer differential tuition rates uh, based on that impact? I hear most of you saying no, but I do think when we think about the lawsuits that came forward, it does bring to mind for many the question of, did I get what I paid for at the eight, nine, a thousand dollar a credit rate that they're paying? And if you do have that, what will your process be for refunds? For many of you, I'm, uh, as I'm talking with many of you, you credited re, uh, refunds for room and board to the fall semester. If the students have to leave early or they're leaving two weeks earlier or you know that already, are you changing your billing strategy so that you are not billing for those last two weeks of the semester? And what will that loss in room and board really be for you? So I think as you're looking at that uh, fiscal year 21 and the challenges, um, I would say, you know, yes, we've been talking an awful lot about fall loss, but I also think we potentially will continue to see loss in the spring. If, while it's certainly an unclear time for us to, to know to use historic patterns, we know that historically, if a student doesn't come in the fall, he or she often does not come for the spring. So I know many people are talking about deferrals and opportunities there, but I think you're still going to see revenue losses for the spring. In talking with many folks, I'm hearing many of you talk about fall losses that you're preparing for, not thinking through the fiscal gap that you'll have for the spring. And I also think you may see a larger summer gap 
than expected in that we are starting to see things that says that uh, summer plans and activities may continue to change uh, for us. And so what will that mean? So thinking about all of this from a policy training and budget gap perspective, um, if you have not begun to talk about these things, I think under this policy uh, window, you are going to get an awful lot of questions come uh, four weeks from now when you send out your initial bill. So I think people did understand this was completely unforeseenable <laughs> for the fall or for the spring semester. For the fall, I don't think people are going to be as forgiving. I think when you think about your refund policy, what exactly is that going to be? How are you going to spell that out differently? Will it be different? If it isn't going to be different, how are you training your staff to be prepared to talk through, here is what our refund policy will be, here's what our protocols are going to be. For the most part, people had already paid you. Now what we'll have for the fall is people who haven't paid you yet, and so they're going to be much more skeptical about the dollars they're giving to you if there's not clear written policy on refunds. The second is your medical withdrawal policy. How much will you give back? Uh, when I was the VP at uh, Lynn University, we really negotiated with the family about you know, how much would we give back? Uh, would we credit dollars for the next semester? Uh, families may not be as receptive to that as you're thinking about your work. Um, what if their son or daughter gets sick and it's halfway through the semester and they're so sick that they can't pre complete their coursework? Will you refund all those dollars? How, how will they get those dollars back? Many people don't understand the financial aid implications of that. So there's details to be working through with your policies there. Residence hall ones have been pretty easy and I think you'll follow that same process. But I think something that is coming up and certainly coming up quite a bit more in the media is if you go online for the fall, what will your tuition rate be? And I know many of you have a face-to-face -face rate and a tuition rate for online students. If that is different, how are you going to justify that difference between those two? And I know for many of you, you've got a significant difference. Some of you are $800-ish of credit face-to-face, $300-ish -face, of credit uh, online. How will you differentiate for that? Or let's say we only go eight weeks face-to-face -face and then eight weeks uh, online for the fall. Will you use a differential rate for that? And if not, where are your policies? How are you documenting those? I think these are gonna have huge financial impacts uh, potentially on you if you are not preparing for them. Next, under training, um, I, I have heard some great stories about how easy it's been for some of you to go online. I have heard stories that have been the complete opposite. So what are you doing in terms of training today to help your faculty to be able to be fully prepared to integrate online activity with face-to-face? -face? There is a cost to this. There are dollars that are attached to that. But I, I tell you what I'm hearing more than anything else is, well, our faculty under, aren't under contract right now. I don't know any consumer-related organization that's going to say, oh, no problem. We understand your faculty weren't on contract right now. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, we, we've got to be helping our faculty to be fully prepared to be able to teach in this very likely hybrid scenario as we move forward. And then the second piece of training and the costs that are associated to that are safety and security preparation. How are you preparing your staff, putting the protocols in place, getting the equipment that you need, uh, to be there to be ready to go and as you're figuring out those policies and those scenarios so above we were talking about what your overall gap would be here you're seeing all the additional costs you're saying so what are your budget gaps and therefore what are the expenses that you can expect to be planning for will you have more furloughs and layoffs salary reductions benefit reductions uh, in those salary and reductions uh, i'm hearing an awful lot about compression and needing to figure out as you're cutting 20% off the top, 15% off the next level, 10% off the next, it is bringing that gap down. So how might you really look at that? Many of you have made benefit reductions over the last decade. What do you do there? Uh, again, will these be one-time cuts? Uh, uh, I would be very cautious in how you're messaging those out. Will you go through new budget approval processes? And what is your communication plan? Uh, thinking that that is critical as we move forward. And as you look at your budget realities, uh, you know, you can't cut your way uh, to uh, all the things that you need. And so how are you stress testing? How much cash reserves do you have in place? And more so, what is your cash flow? Um, you know, what I think hit so many of us so hard in April and May was that our cash flow is at our lowest it is for the uh, fiscal year. 
what will your cash flow be if uh, your revenues do not come in place? And what are your line of credit processes that you have? I am hearing about institutions asking for five, 10, 20 million dollars, some of you bigger ones, of course, much more, but really thinking about that as well as what is your endowment spending or borrowing policies. If you and your board have not been talking about that, now is the time to do so. You will have additional expenses. How are you thinking those through? Each one of these you can see has its own link. I think in particular, something that uh, I'm hearing is that you're expecting your food service provider to charge the same rate and yet provide a very different form of service. I'm not sure that's realistic as you look to the future. And what type of 24 seven tech support do you need? I'm hearing about a lot more institutions looking to farm out additional tech support. I would argue use your students for that. But uh, uh, I think that there is expenses there. And in the midst of all of this crisis, how are you continuing to think about your growth strategy? Certainly this is your opportunity to be more transfer friendly. This is your opportunity to add more online programs. And in particular, if you're working on new program development, you must continue to keep doing that. When we look holistically at this over the next five years, you've got to be implementing new programs. Into You've been planning those programs for a reason. They align with market demand and opportunity. How do you continue to do that? And where I don't see many institutions of, of your uh, typically spending much time talking about how do you target recruit for activities where there are high net revenue programs? What are your 10 programs that make the most money that also align with market demand? How are you marketing those to be able to capture more net revenues for your institution? Some other immediate considerations to think about uh, certainly as international students. As you think about those, uh, we are now uh, expecting that you will see potentially 20% of your incoming fresh, 20% uh, of those who would have been international coming to your campuses. Some are reporting down to 10%. Uh, we think there will be huge challenges there. What are the additional costs you're putting into place or planning for for move-in? And finally, what about construction and renovation? Many things were delayed. What will those delays mean for you? As you think about summer melt, uh, I do think there is a softer deposit in place and in particular waitlist concerns continue to be a challenge. And so how do you think about uh, counteracting that? What school spirit activities can you do online? What are ways that you can segment communication plans to prospective students? I'm actually hearing that deposits as of today are pretty strong, but um, where will you be if you're not actively recruiting these students? And I think a full core press needs to come in July in a time when we've usually backed away and said, oh, it's good, it's gonna fall into place where it needs to. You need to be pushing incredibly hard right there. And don't forget about the NACAC changes. NACAC policy changes said, you can be recruiting any student any day you want to all the way up until the day school starts. So how are you redesigning that? How are you thinking about uh, cancellation uh, processes and how are you supporting staff as you even think about the spring semester? I think for those who don't come, again, we just can't put a pause back that says, oh, that's okay, but our, our recruitment staff are gonna be out on the road trying to recruit the fall of 21 class. Who's doing the recruitment for those uh, who didn't engage and involve? Uh, uh, heading towards the end here, thinking about uh, financial planning and your structures. Uh, here are two things I would say I'm hearing uh, more often than not. Um, I'm hearing a lot of you talk to me about what seems to be like rearranging the deck chairs. Well, we cut this position and we're going to have these people report to that. We cut this position, we're going to have that. I think it's time to rethink an entirely leaner organization. Administratively, how are you really reducing administrative units, eliminating the silos? You're going to gain your revenue gains at cutting from the top, not from cutting at the bottom. Those are where your dollars are at. So how are you really thinking through a much more efficient operational model that aligns with your mission structures and resources that you need to provide strong solutions? You need to be marketing, uh, telling those success and feel good stories, and don't forget to focus on that 21 class. Uh, if you saw the data that came out today, overwhelmingly few numbers of uh, juniors who are engaged and involved in the recruitment process as they normally would be. And last, let me close with how do you continue to focus on your mission? Uh, you know, in financially challenging times, Catholic institutions have always come to the rise of serving students who have been in vulnerable populations. Uh, how are you thinking about protecting the jobs of the lowest paid employees? That has been something that you have done very well. 
but how are you linking action and mission? What is your financial aid strategy? I'm not sure additional scholarship dollars are necessarily the thing that needs to be done, but you certainly need to be thinking about need-based aid, payment plans, and drops for non-payment. Uh, within each of those, how are you allowing opportunity uh, for some flexibility within that without completely losing your bottom line? In particular, I'm concerned about our strict drop for non-payment policies and the reality of what that might be. And if I could underscore anything in this 20 minutes, it would be uh, really thinking about how are you training your uh, financial aid bursar, registrar, and other staff to really be talking about professional judgment empowerment. So that really falls to your financial aid staff, but where are uh, those three teams who are gonna be interacting an awful lot in academic advisors with students who are in trouble? If someone says, my parents have both lost their jobs, they are eligible for more aid, but professional judgment is a part of that. So how are you really empowering them uh, to be moving forward uh, with that as you think about your strategy to yield the strongest class you can. So Tom, with that, I'll turn it back over so that we can share some discussion. Jim, thanks thanks so much, and thank you for covering as many bases as you did in a very efficient way. Before we move to our discussion, let me just do a little bit of introduction of our, of our three panelists. You have all now met uh, Jim Hundreiser. Jim is the inaugural vice president for consulting with Nakubo. Uh, his team works to create practical solutions to complex problems. And as you heard him mention just briefly, Jim has over 30 years in higher education, which includes leadership roles at the Association of Governing Boards, where some of you may have interacted with him before. He also served at Plymouth State and Lynn Universities and Marymount Manhattan College. We have two of our colleagues uh, joining us today. Uh, Colleen Hanich joined LaSalle University in 2015 um, as its first non-Christian brother and first woman president. Colleen is a native Canadian who previously led Brescia University College, which is Canada's only women's college uh, sponsored by the Ursulines. She did that for seven years and she is by training a corporate attorney and a former law professor. Uh, Arvid Johnson has been president of S University of St. Francis in Illinois since 2013. Uh, before that, he was at Dominican University as a professor of management and dean of the Brennan School of Business. And before his higher education career, Arvid worked for over 15 years in engineering and manufacturing and in senior management positions in the defense aerospace and marketing research uh, industries. So Colleen and Arv, let, let's start with a very pragmatic question. Um, what cost cuts, budget adjustments have you already made for the coming financial year, uh, and what ones are still considering? Colleen, maybe start with you. Sure, and thanks very much for having me, Tom. It's a great time to be with my colleagues at ACCU as we're navigating a challenging environment, to be sure. So at LaSalle, we have been going through a pretty significant administrative restructure, and I know I'm gonna speak a little bit about that more um, shortly, but um, certainly that has been the base of how we've been approaching a much tighter budget, both, both the top line and the bottom line. So imagining a scenario where our class does not fully come in or our retention is not where we think it's going to be, and then managing expenses on the, on the bottom side at the same time. So um, in our case, that led to some very unfortunate um, rifts, some layoffs last week, some reductions, and so on. I know that many of you are either have already made similar announcements or in the midst of, of working through that, but as, as was pointed out earlier in, in Jim's comments, we really need to be almost prophetic looking down the road to what might happen or what might not happen and, and plan accordingly because we simply will not be as nimble as we need to be if the class doesn't land as we think it's going to and so on. So at LaSalle, we've, we've done everything from administrative restructure to just tightening of belts and refocus on compensation and the whole nine yards. It's, it's been a really fun days, let me tell you. <laughs> Arvid, how about you? What are some of the specific uh, steps that you have taken? Sure. Well, uh, we had our, our board meeting in February, at which we presented the budget for fiscal 21, and then had to throw it out almost immediately uh, thereafter, and have come back to the board at our, at our June meeting with a revised budget for next year. Uh, it was developed by our budgeting planning committee, which is uh, led by our CFO. And uh, a lot of what we've done is what I will say uh, are anticipatory cuts. Uh, 
if you have to make a reduction, if you make a small reduction early on, that can sometimes save you from a reduction later. So we've already put in place a, a forecast for next year in which the revenue should be down at about eight or nine percent from what our baseline budget was. And we've right sized the expenditures to, to be in line with that. We've reduced our labor and non-labor expenses by about 7%. That includes a hiring freeze, includes even a hiring freeze on vice presidents. I lost a vice president and uh, am not replacing him, so we did some administrative structuring. We've done, at the suggestion of our budget and planning committee, um, a 7.5% salary reduction across the board for all faculty, staff, and administrators who make more than $45,000 a year. So protecting our most vulnerable employees but making sure that everyone shares in the pain of a salary reduction. Uh, we did freeze or no 403B contributions, um, do have a hiring freeze, and, and we did implement a, a small number of short-term furloughs over the summer for folks who could not come onto campus. Um, one of the things we did to reduce our operating footprint is put in place a modified operations plan in which right now, while we do have some students still living on campus and we do have summer classes going on, primarily in online format, uh, we are fundamentally only operating one building on campus right now and asking folks to work from home as much as possible in, in concert with Governor Pritzker's orders. State of Illinois is a little bit more strict uh, than some of the states out there. But we've already done a lot of the, what I'll say, proactive budget reductions. And then as we come in, into the fall and see where things end up, where they end up amongst the various uh, scenarios that we've identified, we do have some additional cuts that we could make if necessary, whether it's professional development or travel, continuing our operating format. Uh, but we're trying to, to act as, as soon as possible, but in a way that protects capacity. And I'll speak a little bit more about that later as well. Yeah, let's, let's move from the specific to, to uh, the more philosophical. And I know that you two are both presidents who have made some very significant uh, budget cuts uh, in terms of scope and scale. And I'm worried if you might talk a little bit about the, um, the philosophy or the strategy that has guided the way you've approached things. Because we have presidents on the call who have made some incremental reductions now and are planning to make more later. There are some that are waiting a little bit longer to see how fall enrollment comes in. And then there are some of you who have made some very significant changes already. So maybe Arv, start with you before going back to Colleen. What's guided your thinking as to how you have approached this? Um, what kind of strategy have you have you felt was the most um, effective for you? Um, one of the things I sometimes get criticized for being uh, telling the same story over and over about is I'm, I'm a firm believer that you have to make sure that your operating expenses are fit to your student revenues. So one of the things that we always evaluate our budgets on is basically core margin from operations. What percentage of our revenues are covered by student expenses, whether, uh, student uh, revenues, whether it's tuition, room and board, other student fees? And we really try to protect our additional funds, whether that's fundraising, grants, and other activities, uh, to make strategic investments. As Jim mentioned, you really can't cut your way to growth. And we want to make sure that we're continuing to make certain targeted strategic investments as part of our strategic initiatives fund, which is a set aside that my board requires in our budget each year. So what we're trying to do philosophically, Tom, is protect capacity um, by really right-sizing operations. And, and we've been doing this for years. So we're, we, we like to say we're running a fairly lean operation. We may have to get leaner in the future, but it's given us lots of different growth opportunities that we think are resulting in a little bit firmer fall than, than we were originally concerned about. Colleen, maybe talk about your overall strategy, and I think this would be a good time for you to talk about why and how you've taken on some very significant administrative restructuring, because I think that's something that our presidents would really appreciate some, uh, some perspective on. You're on, Jim? Uh, Colleen, you're on mute. Thanks, Tom. We've been struggling for a period of time at LaSalle and looking for a way to really right size our operation um, in terms of revenue and expenses more, more broadly. We serve a very underserved population. Over 40% of our students are Pell eligible. We are obviously in a, an urban, a, a, a very 
um, urban setting in, in North Philadelphia and, and the students who we serve are exactly the students we want to serve from a mission perspective, but are very needy. There's just no other way to put that. So what LaSalle began and, and worked through this year was a significant top to bottom review of looking at our expenses, looking at our revenues, looking at opportunities for growth, whether it be curricular growth or advancement and so on, and looking for opportunities to do things a little bit differently on the expense side. So um, there were some uh, chances on, on my cabinet, for example, to combine certain um, uh, departments that made a lot more sense that they not be siloed and that they be more interdisciplinary. Of note, I combined um, student affairs and enrollment management, not so much for the savings, because frankly, we had to turn around and, and hire an additional um, mid-level manager, but it was so that we could solve retention, because what we were finding is a certain philosophy in enrollment management that, hey, we, we get them in, and then we just don't need to worry anymore, and then student affairs was trying to deal with keeping them and so on. So some of these changes that we have gone through in the past year looking at this top to bottom analysis were truly expense driven or revenue driven but others were just better practice we worked um, we had a very generous donor who stepped in to help us we worked in partnership with mckinsey and company which if any of you have worked with them before you will know that there is some significant thought leadership there and helping us to reimagine where we fit in the broader um, environment in a very very congested higher ed setting. There are 13 Catholic universities in Philadelphia before you get to Penn and Drexel and Temple and everybody else. So um, we needed to, to look at all of that. What has resulted from that is a set of initiatives that represent $25 million in improvement on a, a budget that's $120 million. It's pretty significant over the next two years. So we are now in the implementation stage. As I said, some of those changes are in academic programming. Some of those changes are in workload. We've allowed um, a lot of slippage in our um, faculty workload and, and the use of releases very liberally and so on. Some of those changes are simply in how we spend and, and um, instituting spend towers and spend discipline that will get rid of the multitudes of um, credit cards that were out there and being used by people. So a lot of it was a return to just really good business practice and some of it was philosophically thinking about how LaSalle will position itself for the future and in terms of market and areas of academic growth that are not being addressed right now by one of the other 10,000 schools in our city. Um, so that was largely the work that we have undertaken. It has not been incremental. It has been significant and difficult in many ways because just when we were finishing this work, along came COVID, moved all the goalposts, and we found ourselves in some ways having to say, okay, well, that was great, that $25 million plan. And as the board said, I'll take that and re-up you some more. So go back to the drawing board and see what you come up with. And that's where we ended up um, with what we're calling additional measures. As I said, they were announced um, last week on Wednesday. There were some rifts. There was the elimination of the 403B. There were um, hiring freezes and, and um, any sort of freezes and increases in the year ahead and so on. So those are the difficult pieces at the same time um, in the midst of all of this, especially with this tremendous growth blueprint, which we have now just passed. And you look around and say, I, I hope I have the horsepower to deliver that um, in the days moving forward. So very positive in that we're very focused on where this goes. But what we do know is if we don't have students on campus this fall and this spring, it will be um, utterly devastating for this university. Um, Arvid, Colleen has just been giving us a really good, um, a really good perspective on long-term sustainability. You mentioned salary reductions that you had undertaken, and I know I talked to three or four presidents in the last week that have just put some sort of practice of salary reduction in place. Can you talk a little bit about how you um, see balancing some short-term actions that might only be for a year versus the long-term? What kind of short-term actions um, do you think makes some sense for presidents to consider recognizing that they aren't going to be the kinds of things you could sustain over the long term, as opposed to some of the kinds of savings that Colleen was just talking about? Sure, sure, Tom. And I, I think that uh, philosophically, you have to distinguish between what you do to protect capacity and ensure that you can be there for the, the backside of the V, not just the going down, but the backside when things recover. And so, you know, part of the approach we took towards salary reductions was, again, focusing on the most highly compensated individuals 
and spreading it across the board so everyone gave a little bit, that allowed us to protect more jobs and to be able to avoid uh, significant layoffs. And that was a decision that, and well, I know we're going to talk about governance a little bit later, but that was a something, that was a decision that was collectively uh, developed by our budget and planning committee, which includes a large number of faculty and staff members from across the university. I think the, the worst thing you can do is to make a reactive decision right now. Uh, none of us know what the future is going to be, so we just have to be happy with ambiguity. But I think we're trying to identify certain guardrails or parameters and say, well, if we can stay in between here and here, we can pretty much take on whatever is going to be coming our way while still trying to invest in certain key growth initiatives. And I think that's something you heard from Colleen, even in the midst of all of the, the challenge she's had, what she has discussed with her board, what I've discussed with my board, is the importance of continuing to make key targeted investments in future growth opportunities. Um, because you, you don't want to make a, a bunch of short-term cuts that you're going to come to regret in the future. Yeah, one of the things that I remember you and, our, you and I talked about, Arv, um, about a week or so ago was how financial scenario planning is different from in the past. Uh, and you have someone like most of the presidents online have done financial scenario planning as a matter of course, but maybe you'd talk a little bit about what you see as some of the differences and Jim, maybe get a little bit of a perspective from you from the Kubo on how financial scenario planning should and needs to differ from the way we might have done it five years ago. Sure. Um, the, the way I, part of the way I described it to, to Tom the other day is we're actually doing real scenario planning now. I think traditionally what passed for scenario planning was playing around on the edges of the budget. Well, what if we assume a 1% here versus a 2% there or something? True scenario planning is it was developed in the defense aerospace industry and in the oil exploration industry at Royal Dutch Shell was looking at dramatically different visions for the future, not just one year out or two years out, but five or 10 years out, and trying to figure out how you need to make certain decisions upfront to try and ensure that you will be able to, what would you do if that scenario actually evolved? And so one of the things in Jim's presentation, he threw out some scary numbers in terms of the percentage reductions in revenues. And in true scenario planning looks at that, what if you have no face-to-face -face classes for the next 18 months? What if the entire adult education market, and this includes both degree completion and graduate students, becomes an online market? How does that change your value proposition? How does that change what you're doing and what you wanna make sure you're doing in scenario planning is trying to identify the, what you would do in an uncertain future. And you come up with several different scenarios that are often contradictory, and that's perfectly fine, but to identify what you would do in each of those cases, that's true strategic thinking, and that's real scenario planning, rather than just playing at the edges of a spreadsheet. Tom? Yeah, Colleen and then Jim. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I think what makes this such a challenge, and I know that we're all running these back to campus teams, planning teams, scenario teams, et cetera, what makes it so challenging is the number of variables that are up for grabs right now. It's not like you're just playing with enrollment, up 10, down 20. It's enrollment on campus, off campus, price, cost, what will the market bear? What happens if other schools move in different directions? It becomes multifaceted and complex immediately. So um, granted, all of those can be boiled down to an economic value so that you can play with the economic values. but by just pulling one lever half an inch and the other lever two inches, you find yourself completely down a road that of, of no recovery and yet a tweak in the opposite direction. I think that is the challenge that we are facing right now is there are so many variables and so little information around what the possible range of, of a degree of impact might be. There's a significant difference between 10% revenue hit and 25% and yet nobody can even tell us with any kind of certainty, whether it's likely to be one or the other, we can't even narrow it down to a 15% range. Mm -hmm. Jim, maybe a, a final comment on this topic from you? I would add, as you think about that scenario planning, what are the resources, how much will your resources be, what is the structure, and how does that link then to your solutions? Or what, uh, somewhere in that. So really thinking through with this, then our structure needs to be this. And what, what, what will we provide? How, how will we serve our students and continue our mission? 
And I think that we uh, have typically not drilled down enough or thought big enough to say we could become this in a new way, really continuing to live on our mission in some different, different opportunity. But this is what it would mean from a structure resource perspective to make that happen. And no matter what you do, you can be 100% confident that your forecast is wrong. That's just Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. Good, good, good test of humility. Uh, folks, we're going to move to three very specific areas that, that presidents um, ask that we uh, address. Pricing of online versus hybrid versus in-seat education. How you are ensuring, and maybe that's a, an aggressive term, comparability of students' experience in the online environment remembering what our value proposition is at ACCU to educate the whole person. And then thirdly, uh, a couple of you wanted to um, have some questions about athletics. So um, Arv, um, I know you have some strong opinions about pricing strategy with online, in-seat, and hybrid. Maybe you'd start and, and tell us what your view on that is. Sure, and, and in part it's because of the historical traditions at the University of St. Francis. On any given semester pre-COVID, over half of my students, particularly about three quarters of my graduate students, are taking courses online in any given semester. So when we developed a uh, pricing strategy over the years, we price by program, not by delivery format. So whether it's an MBA that is being offered face-to-face -face in Joliet, or an MBA that's fully online, or a hybrid MBA in which students move back and forth between classrooms and online co coursework, they're priced in the same way. Now to do that, you also have to think about what your value proposition is. And one of the questions I had asked and challenged my cabinet when I arrived at USF over seven years ago was, how does the online student experience indicate that we're Catholic and Franciscan? And I will say initially, we didn't have a really good answer to that, but over the last seven years, we've developed incredible online engagement and to, uh, uh, onboarding materials as well as ongoing engagement methods to really make sure that our, all of our students understand our Catholic Franciscan heritage and what it means to go to the University of St. Francis. Thus, when it became time for us to move our courses online in March, um, with very little planning, we had faculty that were used to it um, that helped the transition, but probably the best thing that happened from our student engagement perspective was that folks who couldn't do anything else because they couldn't come on campus took a list of 20 or 30 students and had a regular communications plan. This included my student affairs, my mission and ministry folks, folks from financial aid, folks who couldn't do their job from home, took the care and feeding of our students very personally, and that provided a good experience. Our Student Government Association and Student Activities Board did a lot of online networking activities. We had online retreats. We still try to keep as much of the on-campus experience there for students, even to the point where students started to say, stop bothering me, I'm working on my coursework. Give us a break, I'll let you know if there's a problem. I think that's something you can't over communicate with the students enough until they tell you that. But our, our attitude is online or face-to-face -face is an equivalent experience. And it may not be identical, but we wanna ensure it's as equivalent as possible. Colleen, is that an issue that you have taken on at LaSalle um, over the long term or just more recently? Sure. So we're nowhere near as sophisticated in our online delivery and experience as what you just heard Arvid describe from University of St. Francis. This has been a rather um, a new experience for us on the undergraduate side. Um, however, I believe that the matter of pricing is almost a red herring and you do have to dig in a lot deeper and talk about value and the holistic mm. experience. And one of the things that we learned this spring, there's always examples to the contrary or exceptions, but um, you know, LaSallean schools are obviously St. John Baptist LaSalle is the patron, uh, patron center of educators. And so there is those who are drawn to this mission on our campuses across the United States and beyond are those who are extremely focused on keeping the student at the, the center of the educational enterprise. And so for our faculty, that became a very automatic and organic shift that when they were remote, the stories that we heard of just remarkable engagement, creative engagement, engagement. Our faculty have not necessarily been um, full early adopters of hybrid or online models, certainly not in the undergraduate sphere. I think they have shifted. Many of them are, and in fact, now we're trying to think 
if we do get back to campus by August 17th, which is our plan, there are a number of faculty saying, well, I, I actually came up with some neat ways of doing things. I'm not so sure I want to be face to face all the time again. We're like, come on back. You're going to be fine. Just come back to campus. So um, we saw we also saw some students who had not been thriving necessarily, some mm -hmm. very interesting data, who were suddenly A's in everything, who were just able to absolutely um, thrive in that environment. So for us, it is not, the, the delivery modality is not at all how you measure the cost. It is the overall experience. So our challenge is making sure that we can deliver that full multifaceted um, holistic experience that we we promise and that's a question about value proposition that is delivery modality is a very small part of that and so we're looking through that lens in all of the planning that we're doing whether it is how students are going to live in our residence halls how they're going to um, engage in clubs and so on when there are limited sizes for what athletics and how that is going to play out for me those are the much bigger questions about our value proposition Jim, you mentioned, you mentioned before that um, you were hearing of a lot of schools that already price online and hybrid and in-seat differently. And two of the presidents who wrote me and asked to raise this issue, they right now price online, in-seat, and hybrid differently. So can you talk a little bit from your perspective about some of the advantages and disadvantages? You've heard a strong case from Arvid of pricing them the same, um, and certainly there are presidents who have traditionally price them differently. Uh, any sort of concluding perspective you might uh, give us on this topic? I certainly understand how we got there. I think what we didn't talk a lot about was um, that we discount our students for the most part today, some of them pretty significantly. And so uh, when you're thinking about your pricing strategy, we don't ever discount the online student, or if you're offering that online at three or $400 a credit, that is at that sort of discounted rate. What is your discounted rate for um, your students who are face-to-face? -face? It may be within dollars of each other. So is the reverse strategy from a very short-term perspective, you moving yourself back up to that rate and using the process that are described and then potentially discounting those students uh, off of that for, for a temporary strategy just to get you through this next uh, uh, 12 months. But I couldn't agree more about the value proposition and the pieces that were described. But I do know tactically, uh, some of you need to figure this out in the next three to four weeks before you send out your bills and get all of your uh, uh, tuition and fees posted for the next academic year. So I think there's this opportunity for you to think that through by doing a tuition discounting strategy uh, for online, fully online students who are currently online and, and doing it in the reverse. If that's your quickest solution you need to get to the September result that you need versus all the students who are gonna call and say, you went online and now what? Before we go to governance, um, I want to go back to something that both Arv and Colleen raised. Both of you, both of you reminded all of us of something we know is obvious but don't always necessarily focus on, and that is not only can you not cut your way to prosperity, but you have to find ways to grow revenue and particularly target investments at the same time that you're cutting. Um, one or two of the presidents who wrote me um, said, you know, what are people doing about fundraising? Um, and so this is an environment in which you hear all sorts of things from presidents ab about this. I'm wondering if either of you or both of you have had some approaches to fundraising that you'd be willing to share. Um, has it been much harder? Has it been easier? Uh, what are some of the ways that you've approached uh, fundraising in this environment? Arv, why don't you start? Sure, well, uh, let me uh, go by way of disclaimer. What if 2020 was your university's centennial year? <laughs> it was for the University of St. Francis, and it is. In fact, I've decided I'm going to call 2021 2020.1 because I want to try and get a redo. I'm trying to return 2020. Um, it has been different. Um, you know, one thing that's been a very natural ask has been for emergency relief funds for students. We did a, a day of giving recently on that that really did a uh, a, a really great outreach and actually helped us get additional funds to help students uh, who are being impacted by COVID-19 and, and the pandemic in general. Um, this is not a time in which you make a lot of uh, new asks, but this is a time in which donor engagement and donor information is critically important. We did an online um, chat with Arvid and the provost about the university session for, for some of our, our best donors and 
even though I didn't think it was anything all that spectacular, the donors just appreciated that opportunity to interact and know that the university was doing well. Um, amazingly, we had as good a year in fundraising last year, our fiscal year ended on May 31st, as we have in any of our recent years during cap capital campaigns. Our donors continued to write checks. And, and I just think that con continuous engagement is more important now than ever before, because a lot of what they're hearing out in the press terrifies them, and they want to know that their school is okay. Elaine? Sure. So I think what I would add to that is we were also surprised at the continuing support. But if you think about fundraising in the 80-20 split, right, 80% of your community gives 20% of the funds and vice versa. Obviously, the tough part for, for many of our schools has been that 20%. So those largest donors who are, at least we're, just, we're finding at LaSalle, a little bit careful about their own funds and where their portfolios are going to land um, in such a volatile market. So we've noticed a little bit of backing off, if you might say a little bit of just sort of slowing down and becoming a little more thoughtful from that group. But the 80% group has swelled in unbelievable ways. So our day of giving got cut very short. It was to have happened very soon after we all scattered um, mid-March. And we held it again um, towards the latter part of May with a fiscal year that ended May 31st. We blew every record we've ever set on day of giving. We were not expecting it but it was unbelievable the organic response and and you know some of it was around student need and emergency funding and so on but a lot of it was i had a great experience at this school i want to make sure that somebody else has it we had i don't know something significant i'm going to say 25% of our graduating class of 2020 gave i mean these young people have just walked into the worst possible professional scenario imaginable and yet we had a huge number of them saying, you know, I know it's really tough and my internships and externships and jobs all just got canceled, but I want to give a little bit back. So we took a great deal of um, comfort, not only in the overall numbers in our day of giving, again, I think we were up 68% over last year, but in the breadth of the base and the improvements in building of that base. So advancement continues to be a challenge um, as we wait for some of those really large donors and we walk with them through this period of volatility. But um, I, am, I would like to say that that has been a pleasant surprise for me, the extent to which that still continues to be um, a great source of support for the university. Good. Well, let's move to our last topic, uh, governance and decision-making. And let me ask Colleen that you start this time. Um, how has decision-making been different? Uh, I'm sure there's many similarities, but how has decision-making been different, um, particularly regarding your board and regarding shared governance? Any, anything interesting or creative to report there? So my board, let me see how to put this. It's almost like I have 40 more people on the cabinet. It's just been really uh, lovely most days and then not so lovely other days, but um, obviously cone of, these- Cone of silence here, cone of silence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, obviously, we're talking about fiduciaries, and so there is a great deal of focus, and I'm, um, when I'm not screaming at the top of my lungs in a dark room, I am very grateful for trustees that take their role as seriously as they do, but um, what I think we're probably many of us struggling with is you have business people and all sorts of folks around that table who are now experts in what you could be doing differently in enrollment, certainly what you could be doing differently in advancement and recruitment and all sorts of things. So for me, managing the board has become a much bigger task than it has. I mean, I've been a president for almost 13 years and, and managing the board has been um, a real interesting challenge through this period. I have um, erred on the side of lots of extra communication. So as soon as we ended up remote, I moved into weekly board calls and updates, which have been pretty straightforward. It was 45 minutes on the phone, very little interaction, but then it was after you'd hang up, there'd be a million outreaches that would come your way. Now we are, uh, there are extra board meetings that have been put on through the summer, which normally we would not have that happen. We had the, we had an odd th thing at LaSalle a year ago, our chair um, had a, a catastrophic stroke. And so we found ourselves in a situation where we had an acting chair anyway through this period. So all of that just conflated into a bit of a perfect storm for us. But 
I have a great board. We're working through it, but they are extraordinarily hands-on right now. And um, that has added a layer of challenge, not only for me, for my CFO, who has is constantly having conversations. Let me show you the wage structure. Let me show you NTR, whatever it is. And for the rest of the cabinet team. Arv, how about you? What's your experience been like? Yeah, I think it's been largely a, a, an affirming one, um, in, in part because we always focus on getting aligned on strategy, and then I inform them of how we're executing on it operationally. And when, when they want to get their hands inside, I kind of remind them they want their arms around the university, but keep their fingers outside of the operations. And by and large, and, and my, my chair has been very good about that, I, I chat with my chair on a, on a regular basis, and I what we've been doing is uh, determining the right times to send out communications to the other trustees. We did just finish a board meeting last week. Uh, it was our, our first virtual board meeting for us, and that gave a lot of fo folks a lot of chance to, 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 to weigh in on some of the strategic parameters that we're operating around. So, for example, in terms of how we were going to finish uh, the, the most recent fiscal year in May, Early on, after uh, we saw what had happened in March, you know, I we got the executive committee to the board together, and we 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 let them know where we thought we were going to end the fiscal year that we just finished, and said that we felt we were in comfortable enough operations that we were going to make a commitment to pay every employee, whether they could come in and do their job or not, while the campus was shut down through the end of May, and that we felt that was an important way of protecting our employees, particularly the most vulnerable, the housekeepers, the maintenance folks who couldn't come in. Um, that, that strategic alignment was important so that as we were then operating and executing on the operational parameters, we just said, hey, we've done this consistent with that. And even in terms of the approach that we've taken to proactively address some of the challenges we're gonna have in the budget next year, again, getting the alignment on the, the boundaries for our parameters and then just letting them know what we're doing within the parameters. Um, so it's it's been good. And uh, and again, part of part of uh, what Tom Flynn always said when we went through new presidents training with him way back when in prehistory is, after about five years, you get the board you deserve. And you know, I think I'm doing okay right now. <laughs> I think that's going to be quoted back to me for as long as I'm alive. As long as I'm here, I will be. That's for sure. Well, I'm looking at the clock. So a, a very quick response from both of you. Say a word about how shared governance has functioned differently than in the past. Sure. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go Colleen. Go ahead. So I, I think, again, when there are difficult times, whether you're having cuts or rollbacks in, in compensation or in 403Bs and so on, there's just a little more scrutiny, I think, on the decisions being made by the university. More scrutiny on athletics. So we're investing in athletics, and yet we're having these other parts of the university that we're having to cut back. Does that make sense? Um, my impact or my approach, rather, to that is to bring – faculty in particular and staff as well closer to the decision so that they are engaged in much of the decision making process. They may not like the outcome, but they're deeply engaged in the process. And I think that that, that brings a certain amount of comfort. Yeah, shared yeah. government stand, may not always be the most efficient, but it sure can do a great job of getting people engaged and, and help them buy into the solution. And I will say, the, the implementation of the budget reductions we put in place for next fiscal year was developed by our budget and planning committee, which again is, is made up of folks of both faculty and non-faculty members and involves in total with its working groups, probably about 40 or 50 people across the university that really developed an approach which I'll be honest with you, might not have been the one I would have chosen, but because they supported it and made it easier to implement. I had two possibilities for, for our last question. I think I'm gonna go with this one. Uh, and it's not one that we have talked about. Colleen, I'll, I'll start with you. Maybe each of you would just say a quick word about what you have learned about your leadership uh, during these last couple of months. Are you leading differently? Do you have some insights into yourself as a leader of a Catholic mm -hmm. university? So for me, it is a continual reminder of mission. And, and I, I hope that that does not sound strange to anyone, but it is a continual reminder of the work that we are trying to lead and that I need to be grounded in that on a daily basis. When times are a little easier, I might that grounding might be easier and I don't need to return to it as often. I am finding for myself having a robust prayer life and being extremely focused on the work that we are all doing 
together to support the students in front of us is what allows me to, I think, make the best decisions that I can make. And they're not all good ones, but um, being reminded of that really, really helps. That's wonderful. That's, that's inspiring. Arv? I'm not sure I can, I can top that one, Colleen. Yeah. I think that, that, that was great. Um, maybe on a, a little less uh, serious note, though, I think what you have to realize as a leader is, you know, in, in particularly in times like this, have no illusions that you're the dog wagging the tail. You're the tail. <laughs> and part of what you can just do is go along for the ride. And in that sense, that's very Franciscan. So that's how I'll tie it into mission, Colleen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, um, a, a word of thanks from uh, all of us uh, who have not been the panelists, um, all of my colleagues on, online. Great thank you to, to Jim for helping organize this, uh, this webinar and for your presentation. Colleen and Arb, thank you so much for your insights and, and your candor. Uh, you will get a quick email from uh, Dennis tomorrow asking for any suggestions you have as to how we can do these things better um, over, the next, uh, over the next two Mondays. And we will, of course, be back in touch with you the end of the month for some suggestions about the future. But in the meantime, I um, hope to see you again uh, next Monday when we talk about staying reopened. So have a good week, everyone, and, and thanks, thanks, thanks to everyone. Thanks. Bye, Bye, -bye. Thank you.